Welcome to Words to Grow Right with Reverend Jimmy Hicks Jr. Amen. And so um, this is our last um, week in November. And I, again, we're, we're continuing with this series that we, we've had all year long dealing with um, James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen? Confronting that devil all, all year long, you know, his presence in our lives. Our, theme, our other theme scripture is Galatians 5 and 17. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. So we've got an understanding from those, from those understanding that there's this battle, there's these things going on. Matter of fact, that particular um, slide that I have for here, don't, don't put it on just yet. Um, and so we, we've gained our um, understanding in this battle, so much so that in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, we, have, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. And all of those build, um, build up our confidence to understand that uh, we're in a battle, that battle is happening every day, but we don't fight it the way that, uh, you know, normal people fight battles. We fight uh, with God's words. We win with God's words. And so all year long, what I've been asking is that you give me uh, some topics, you know, that, you know, what do you need to submit to God uh, to, to resist the devil in so that he can flee from your lives? Because that's a promise. We just have to do it, um, do it the right way. And so uh, what, we've, what, we've under, what we've understood about that, that submission is that it's not just a God, I give you all of me. You know, we sing that song about all of me and I surrender all. But it is, you, you, you really surrender all when you begin to recognize those areas in your life that you don't want to return. And I, and I can't say this m enough times is that Jesus cleansed you. Jesus cleaned you. Jesus took away, you know, he cleansed you from all your sin. When you accepted him as Lord and Savior, he cleansed you right then and there. Um, my pastor used to say, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. You're not, you're not working on becoming, because if you had to work on becoming, he's not going to the cross. He didn't have to go to the cross. You accepting him as Lord and Savior, you're, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. Now, those things that used to dominate your life want to come back. You didn't do anything to get rid of them except, except Jesus as your Lord and Savior. They now want to come back and dominate your life. You now have the power of the Holy Spirit to tell those things no. And so you have to understand that when they come back, you submit them. When they come back, you submit them to God so that you can resist the devil because the devil is the one that's sending them back. God is not testing you. The devil is the one sending them back to say, oh, yeah, oh, oh yeah, he was cleaned up, but let's see if he, he, can, he can stop doing this. Or let me, let's see if she can stop doing that. The devil is the one, his, his you know, he is the one uh, um, sending stuff back to you. But when he sends them back, you submit them too. You got to understand that. I mean, again, you're not trying to clean yourself up. If you could clean yourself up, you wouldn't need Jesus. Jesus cleans you up. You're just using the power of the Holy Spirit to remain in the state that he, he, he cleans you up. There's too many people trying, well, I'm trying. No, no, no. What you've done is you've accepted back what was cleaned up, and now you're now trying to get it out back out your life. And it wasn't you that got it out your life in the first place. You're as clean. When you accept Jesus, you're as saved, 
Saved from the sin that was sending you to hell? That's what saved means. You are saved as you ever. I didn't understand that when my pastor first said that. You are as saved as you're ever going to be. Your job now is to use the power of the Holy Spirit to, to keep those things from coming back into your life. Amen, somebody. Amen. And so today, I got one, and kid, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for Thanksgiving time, but it fits Thanksgiving time. And, 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 and what I received, this, this, this TV's not on in the back over here. Um, and what I um, received was the need to submit our appetite <laughs> to God. The need to submit our appetite to God. And so we, I, I, needed, I needed to look at that because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm asking questions, you know, what do you mean? Is it just, it's just, you know, and so, you know, I, you know, when I get the question, then I can let the Holy Spirit work with, work, work on me to then give to me, give to you what he's given to me. Amen. So it may not come out exactly the way uh, the person who submitted it to me, um, I might have thought of, but I don't think any of them did. I think, like I said, that last one we were on, that, that was a blessing to me. Submit your low self-esteem uh, to God. It was a blessing to me because, and most of us don't even believe we have that, but that was a blessing to me. And so an appetite, as we begin to look at that, an appetite is a natural desire to satisfy a bodily need. A natural desire to, 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 to um, satisfy a bodily need, physical, emotional, or spiritual. By definition, this word can be interchanged in, you know, in the Bible or with biblical terms, especially the one, the word desire. Remember, because uh, appetite is a natural desire to satisfy a bodily need. And so now when we look in the word and we, can, and we see desire, we can also see appetite. Amen. Psalm 37 and 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires or appetites. Y'all to stay with me. Therefore, a healthy appetite is not something that we want to submit or give over to God. Because these would be the things that we, we want God to fulfill in our lives you know there's some people that you know before they get married it's like oh lord take away my sexual desire and it's like oh, oh, oh wait 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 you don't want the lord to take that away you don't need that when you get married so you know it, it, that's not an unhealthy desire you just have to it has to just be be be, be put under control until you get into the right situation see we got to understand something that like I said, there's some things that are healthy desires that you don't want the Lord to, to take away and you don't want to submit them over to God. However, our appetites must be managed. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12 says, You say I am allowed to do anything, but, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. I want you to understand this point. Point number two. The freedom in Christianity to choose does not allow everything to be our choice. That's a t-shirt, somebody. Everybody is like, oh, I'm free. I'm free in Jesus. I'm free. Yeah, you are, and you're free to choose, but everything can't be what you choose. Everything can't be your choice because everything don't go along with God. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. So your choices must now line up with the holy God. It, it, there's too much of this. I, I got freedom. I'm, I'm free. That's why, you know, it, it wasn't nothing wrong with people saying, what would Jesus do? Because Jesus knew what to do with his freedom. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> 
So everything can't be our choice, everything can't be our desire, and everything can't be a part of our appetite. Look at Philippians 3, verse 18. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think, only about life here on earth. The God is their appetite. Scripture is speaking about an unhealthy appetite that Christians have that take the place of God in our lives. We care more about fulfilling our appetites, our desires, than we do about pleasing God. It ain't a sin. This ain't no sin if I do this. It's not a sin if I fulfill my appetite with everything I want, even if it's it's ungodly and takes me around ungodly people, I don't care. Because it fills my appetite. I have a hunger for that. You may not have a hunger for that. And I don't care what people think, and I don't care what God thinks. I ain't talking about the world. I'm talking about Christians. Their appetite is their God because they don't care about pleasing God. They care about satisfying what they want. So it is our unhealthy appetites that must be submitted to God. An unhappy, uh, unhealthy appetite refers to excessive and or inappropriate desire. So we've got to submit that unhealthy. Now now you can put it up there. Hallelujah. The unhealthy appetite. Thank you, Jesus. I I, I love this when I saw it. Escape the hell of an unhappy, unhealthy. I keep saying unhappy. An unhealthy appetite. Appetite. Escape the hell of an unhealthy appetite. Why? Because an unhealthy appetite is going to send you to hell. Anytime the Bible says that, 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 that their God is their appetite, anytime you put something ahead of God, then that something is going to send you to hell. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And so in the context, because everybody is, you know, we, we, we're looking at this thing, with, and of course, every, the, 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 the number one thing that comes to our mind is food. In the context of food, uh, uh, um, or other things that we consume, it can manifest as an uncontrolled cravings and end up being uh, um, poor dietary choices. Junk food eating unhealthy things, an unhealthy appetite, eating things that you know you should not have. And it's nothing new because it started in Genesis uh, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6. It says, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom of it. It would give uh, her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. That was was an unhealthy appetite because she was craving for something that she already knew that she couldn't have. How many of us crave for things that we know we shouldn't have? That we know it's it's going to affect your blood pressure. That you know it's going to uh, affect your diabetes. That you know. You already know. They already told you don't eat it. Stay away from it. And you still got an unhealthy appetite for things that are dangerous to you. Why? Because you don't care. You just want to satisfy your appetite. 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. An unhealthy appetite can also result in an imbalanced approach to satisfying our physical and our emotional needs. It was because of her, hallelujah, unhealthy appetite that, 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 that the first sin was committed, and now there was consequences for that sin. And the Word of God said in Genesis 3 and 16, it says, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Most of us don't see these as uh, uh, unhealthy appetites. But these were unhealthy appetites that, that, that became a uh, consequence of, the un, uh, of her satisfying an appetite that she was not supposed to satisfy, and that was eating the fruit off of the forbidden tree. And so now the Bible says that your desire is going to be to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Both of those things, the desire for the husband is the desire to control, and him ruling over is something that he shouldn't be doing. He should have loving leadership. So now, uh, um, these are examples of unhealthy emotional appetites that require the word of God in order to release them. They, they, they desire to do some things that they're not supposed to, uh, uh, that, that didn't come when, when God created Adam and Eve. They were not a part of the package. They became a part of the package because of sin. A woman trying to control everything, that's a sin. A man trying to rule over his house with an iron fist, that's a sin. That's a consequence of sin. And the only way out of those is word of God. Those are unhealthy appetites or unhealthy desires. Now, don't have to amen me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Unhealthy appetites can extend, our, 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 extend to other aspects of life, such as material possessions. We'll get into those. Uh, and, and even substance abuses, where appetites can become excessive and lead to a whole lot of negative outcomes. A whole lot of negative outcomes because you are now craving. You know, what, what, is, what, is, what is withdrawal? Withdrawal from, from drugs or withdrawal from ap alcohol or is, is, is just your body so used to what you give, have been given it and now it's trying to, it's like, uh-uh. What you doing? You're trying to, you're trying to stop. Uh-uh. Then you go into those, those withdrawal symptoms. That, that, that's just strong, strong appetite. Your body like, uh-uh, you better give that to me. You better give it to me. The body is, you better understand something. You, you know, I don't know when you got saved, but up until the point that you got saved, you gave your body whatever it asked for. You satisfied every appetite that you could. If you had to get up in the middle of the night and you wanted something, you, you go looking for it. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking. I ain't, I, I ain't gonna be bothered to him. Ain't that appetite come? Maybe you answer the phone. I don't even like her, but well, your appetite came up. You called her. I ain't, I ain't always been saved. Oh, hallelujah! Praise the Lord. And so appetites. Hallelujah, these, 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 these appetites that the, that, that the Word of God says become, uh, you know, your appetite becomes your God. The Bible, you know, the Bible calls it that, but the world, the world has its answers to that. And, and, and to deal with unhappy, unhealthy, I keep saying that, unhealthy, to deal with unhealthy appetites, the, the world begins to label them as addictions. 
Oh, he's addicted to that. Yeah, he's got a whole lot of unhealthy appetites that he can't stop feeding. Yeah, that's what they, that's what they say, y'all. I got to feed it. I got to, I got to feed this thing. A drug addiction, whatever it might be, a, a sexual addiction, whatever it might be, is something they have to feed. They have to continue to feed it. The world calls it addiction, but it's not. It, 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 it's the un, unhealthy uh, uh, appetites that, that the Bible already talks about. And so the biblical remedies to unhealthy appetites are prescribed in the word. And, 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 and three of them, you know, one is called moderation. One is called self-control. And the other is called contentment. Moderation is the avoidance of excess or extreme. You want to you, you submit unhealthy appetites to, to, to God, uh, then you have to understand that the, the, the Word of God is, is what you're going to need to apply to your life. And, and, one of the, and, and one of the first solutions is you've got to learn what the Word of God says about moderation. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What's that? Let your moderation, you, you know, let, it's, it's saying that, that you should be known by your moderation. You ain't too high. You know, you ain't too low. Regardless of what's going on, you know, you, 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 ain't, you ain't too high because you know it's the Lord that got me there. You ain't too low because you know it's the Lord going to bring you up. And so you're just right here. I, I'm serving God. I mean, I know what I'm serving. I know how I'm living. I ain't getting too high. I ain't getting too low. I ain't taking too much of the credit. And, I, and, 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 and I, I'm not thinking God has abandoned me. I, my life is going to be known. It should be known by moderation. I know who I serve. I know how I live. And I know what he promised. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Here, here's, here's one that, that, that I love, and I know people just take this to, to give them permission to drink. Don't be drunk with wine because that would ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at something real quick. The Bible says, first of all, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. That's, that's right there that said, if you are drunk, your life is ruined. So who's going to play with that? First of all, who's playing with that? Because the Bible says, if you are drunk, your life is ruined. Now, who determines if you're drunk or not? Is it you, drinker? How many people, how many people, you ain't got to raise your hand, have, have you know, be like, oh, I'm just going to drink a, 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 a glass. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm just a one glass person. But then all of a sudden, you drink your glass and you're like, Ooh, oh, oh, man, I'm lightheaded. You're drunk. You're drunk. Well, it was just one glass. It don't, it don't matter. You have now, uh, you know, your qualifications you, is it don't be drunk. You have now disobeyed the word. Well, it was only one glass. I, I, the Bible don't say just take one glass. It says don't be drunk. Who determines it? It's not you that determines it. You can't, you can't, you, you know, you can't con your way out of it. Just like you can't con your, if you're drunk, you're drunk. And you can't con your way out of the, with the police. They have this thing you blow in, y'all. And how many people have said, well, that was, I, I just, I'm just going to have one and I'm just going to leave. And then you blow in and they say, well, you are point so-and-so above the, the legal limit. You're drunk. You don't have no breathalyzer at home. A glass for somebody is, is it, it, it might be fine, and a glass for somebody else might not be fine. But the thing is, you better be careful, Christian, about disobeying the word of God. Just because you can be a functional drunk does not give you any grace with the word of God. I was able to drive home. I was able to get a go in my house and take my clothes off and get in the bed. So what? You were still drunk. 
If I asked you to walk a straight line, you would not be able to. Being a functional drunk does not excuse you in the word of God. Oh, the world has come up with, with, the, with, 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 with the characteristics of, of, of drunk. The Bible already knew it's a drunk. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I ain't got to amen me. I just, I just do social drink. Bible ain't say nothing about social drinking is okay, and if you get drunk, that's fine, because you were doing it socially. It doesn't say that. But we use it as, a, as an excuse to drink. But we don't care about the word when it says, oh, hallelujah. And the, do, 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 do. Moderation. Moderation. Self-control. The ability to control yourself, specifically your emotions and desires or the expression of them in your behavior, especially in difficult situations. Everybody, control they, everybody can control their emotions when things are, are going well. But let, let, let some things go, let, you know, uh, Arrive, let somebody say something to you. Let somebody do something to you. Can you have self-control under those circumstances? Because if you cannot, then you, you, you will give in to unhealthy appetites. Proverbs 25 and 28. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. You need moderation in, in order to deal with unhappy ap appetite, unhealthy appetites, unhealthy appetites. You have to have moderation, self-control. Titus, two, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this, we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, living it in this world cruel and evil world are like the bricks that we build the wall that we need to live in this in this world you know like i said too that that surrounds us that surrounds our city and protects us from unhealthy appetites you need you we we need it self-control is is key is key is is it the ability to control yourself the ability to say no. Again, when you start talking about drugs and alcohol, you lose that ability to control yourself. I'll tell one story. I just got to college. I knew, I knew nothing, you know, I, you know I, I was a drinker, I didn't drink, but I knew nothing about this thing. They had this, um, this punch that they soaked fruit and grain alcohol. I mean, it's okay. Y'all can let me know if you know what I'm talking about. And they're looking at me like, what are you talking about, Pastor? I've never heard of that. So they, they, they soaked it in grain alcohol. Then, they, then it was fruit punch. It, was just, it tastes just like fruit punch. So they gave a fruit punch. And so I'm sitting there and, and, and you know, I'm drinking it. And then I, I looked down, and I had this, this new, like, it was like a yellow, white kind of jacket. And I'm looking at it, and I got fruit punch all over me. And now I'm mad. 
And I'm looking at, like, who's next to me, and I want to fight. But I look over at my roommate, and he's cracking up. Somebody had just asked me the time. Wasn't no cell phones then. And my watch is the hand I had my cup in. So I lay like this. I was drunk. And I didn't know it. And I was not under, you know, I was not in control of, I was not, I, I had no self-control over what I was doing. And, you know, and, and, and I didn't even see myself doing it. I didn't even know that I did it. But he sat there and watched me do it. I had one cup. Self-control, moderation. It's better not to do it than, 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 than to do it and to risk going over that moderate, moderated limit. <laughs> so that was, that was self-control, moderation, and number three, contentment. A state of happiness and satisfaction. See, the, a lot of times that, you know, it is the fact that you are not content with who you are, what you have, uh, and that, that you begin to develop unhealthy appetites. You want what you perceive to be good for you. You want what, what is perceived to be what the world says you should have. And so you begin to develop unhealthy appetites for things that, uh, uh, that, that you want because you're not content with your own life. The Bible says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. If you, can't, if you can't be content with living a godly life, but you want a godly life mixed in with everything else that this world can give you, then you, then, then you, you really don't have great wealth. You, you may get everything this world says you can have, but if you don't have godliness and contentment, you really don't have anything. At some point in, in, at some point in a Christian's life, you know, and we, we just had, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, and I know for us, a part of that Thanksgiving was thanking God. You know, I mean, I don't care who came to our Thanksgiving, if, 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 you know, if it was our house, my mom was like, everybody going around the room and going to thank God for something. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry, Auntie BB. I, I, I seem like I don't really care. Everybody going around this room and going to say what you're thankful for. Yeah. I mean, like I said, the, the, the world, you know, we, we, you know and, and our household and our family, we made it about thanking God. You know, and, and, and that's a part of, that's a part of it because there has to be, you, you have to have something that you're thanking God for that you're content with. You can't always, you know, you cannot be dissatisfied with your life all the time. Not being a Christian, you can't. The Bible says true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave. So, we have, so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. And I'm sorry, all of us, we have, we have more food and clothing than we need. Refrigerator full. You got leftover containers, and you're like, I don't like leftovers. <laughs> Closet full, can't get nothing else in there. You look in it, I ain't got nothing to wear. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. You're just not content. You're just not content. I mean, again, Philippians 4 and 11. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. 
And so we've got to understand something, even by that wisdom that, that Paul gave, is that contentment must be learned so that unhealthy appetites can be avoided. Until you, uh, uh, you, know, until you learn. It's, it's, uh, again, don't feel bad. I mean, if I, if I said something and, 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 it, and it came, came under your address there, you know, don't feel bad. All of us have to do Contentment has to be learned. He said, I learned to be content. Contentment has to be learned so that unhealthy appetites can be avoided. If you're never content, then you're going to have appetites for everything. Same thing, with, same thing when you get married. Oh, yes, amen. If you were somebody that was out there and, 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 and you was always breaking up, you know, some go wrong, you broke up with this one. Something else go wrong, you broke up with that one. So you, you, you're preparing yourself for this divorce because you're preparing yourself not to be content for little reasons. But no, no, you got to learn to be content so that you, that you stay in that marriage. It's, it's something that you don't, you don't know it. Nobody, no, nobody knows it when they first get in their marriage. Again, unless that was the first person you ever dated and you have never experienced uh, uh, breaking up with somebody, kicking somebody to the curb, you know, changing your number. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Then you, then, you, then you have prepared yourself to whenever you're not content, you get out. And so contentment has to be learned even in that setting. Oh, where am I at? Oh, praise the Lord. We need bi biblical solutions because we need to avoid the sins that are called by unhealthy appetites. But, uh, but contentment, moderation, and self-control. Contentment, Moderation and self-control. Those are so, those are so important for Christian life. And they're so important to, to, to begin this journey of understanding and looking in our, within ourselves and say, do I have unhealthy appetites? Do I have things that, that I, I have to do? I have to buy. I have to eat. I mean, it's, it's, you would think we would not have to have this conversation with Christians, but there, again, there are Christians who must fulfill things they know they shouldn't fulfill. I mean, I understand something, too. And, and I'm just going to be honest honest with this. I mean, when you, when you get into a, a marriage, let alone, you know, if you, if, if you get into that marriage and you're not saved, how in the world do you stop the unhealthy appetite of having multiple sexual partners? I mean, if that was an appetite that you fulfilled, and then you got into a marriage, well, how, how do you do that? One, if you're unsaved, it's, it's almost impossible. And if you're saved, you, you, you need the word of God. You need to understand it's unhealthy appetite. You need to understand that, that it doesn't, you know, that, that, that moderation, self-control, And contentment. Moderation, self-control, and contentment. I mean, again, people try to, we try to act like as soon as you get saved, you know everything. You don't. That you understand that you don't. You have access to the Father to give you wisdom. You have access to the Word of God to learn and apply to your life. But there's so many aspects of ourselves 
that must be submitted to God so that we can resist the devil so that he can flee. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. There was no way I was going to finish that. I, I knew I wasn't going to finish that. That's, but that's a, that's, a, that's a beginning. It's a beginning. Because it was a great, you know, it, it was a great uh, um, suggestion to give as a topic for a sermon. I thank you for who, uh, to, who gave it to me. Because we don't look at it. We look at, we, we look at appetite from what we eat. And, and again, some of us <laughs> eat in unhealthy ways. You don't need three plates on Thanksgiving just because it's Thanksgiving. And you don't ever eat, well, it's just Thanksgiving. I'm going to eat all three plates. That's, that's, that, that could hurt you. It could hurt you. You know, moderation. Eat some today, eat some tomorrow. It's not going, it ain't like nobody going to take it. There's a lot of leftover. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The world is becoming health conscious. Health conscious. Christians should already be health conscious. Present your bodies as a living, holy and acceptable unto God. Amen. Come on, we're standing. We're standing. I, it, that, again, I, I say it after every, after every topic, but that one, I, that one was good. That one meant something to me. They all do. And they all should. Because I know in my life I've had a lot of unhealthy appetites. And I know I've satisfied a lot of unhealthy appetites. I wish somebody would have, have broke this thing down for me 20 years ago. 30 years ago. Might have helped me stop trying to satisfy some of those unhealthy appetites. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. And that's what this world, that's, that's all this world is suffering from is, is, is giving in to unha unhealthy appetites. Man want a man, woman want a woman. Want to have an abortion? One, those is those is all unhealthy appetites. It's something you want, and it's something you want to fulfill, and you and, and you don't care what anybody thinks. You want it. You want to have it, and you go have it. If there's anyone in here again, like I said, as we do these. You know, you know, James 4 and 7, I mean, it's real. If it's yours, if you have it, this is not about, you know, you know, Pastor, I got it, I'm coming up to the altar. Look, if you want to come to the altar, you can come to the altar. I mean, since COVID, we haven't really opened up the altar, but I just want everybody to know the altar's open. But as we're praying, I mean, again, <laughs> you are the altar. You need to, I mean, you... When, when, when I heard somebody say the altar is for alterations. But guess what? Alterations can take place at any time. You don't need to come to the altar to make alterations in your life that line up with the Word of God. That's why we can have, we don't, we don't, we don't have to come to the priest. We don't have to go behind the veil. I mean, you know, we have to come up. We don't have to kill an animal. We don't have to, we don't do any of those things. We have access to the Father. He's right there. You can talk to him. No, you can talk to him where you are right now. You can talk to him as you go home. You can talk to him no matter in the bed. You can talk, you can talk to him whenever you want to talk to him. But the thing is, when you begin to, amen, amen, amen. When you begin to, to understand that I have some things that need to be submitted to God so that I can resist that devil, so that he can flee from my life. 
then you need to you you need you need to quick fast in a hurry you know start communicating with God I recognize this thing I need to give this thing to you I want you to take it out of my life I don't want to I don't want to accept it I want to send it to you I mean that's the process it's not you know the the the, the the worst thing in the world right now is not the fact that you have it. The worst thing in the world is you, you, you won't give it to God. That's the worst thing. It, there's nothing you can do about your past. What you can do is right now give it to God. Like I said, as these things have been coming, I've been like, oh, 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 no, God, you can have that. I recognize that in my life. I don't want that. It's coming. I'm giving it away. I'm, I'm recognizing Low self-esteem don't even have a choice. Don't have a chance with me. But I, I'm recognizing these things. I'm recognizing, you know, even back, in, even, even unhealthy appetites, commitment. I mean, contentment, self-control, moderation. Begin to think about those things. You could be, you could be thinking about how unreasonable you are. You're unreasonable because you're not content. You're unreasonable because you don't have self-control. You're unreasonable because you are, you are not, it, it's not moderate. It don't always have to be your way. You have been listening to Words to Grow Right with Reverend Jimmy Hicks, Jr. We pray that this word takes root in your life.